our next talk will be presented by Alexander Popov. He is a Linux kernel developer specialized in security. And he will tell us about the race for the root and analysis of the Linux kernel race condition exploit. Give him a welcoming, warm applause. Hello. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Alexander Popov, and the name of my talk is Race for Root. I will tell you about the exploitation of the race condition in the Linux kernel. And first of all, I would like to ask who you have, n have never heard about Linux? Nice. I'm at the right place. So, um, Yes, I'm a Linux kernel developer, and I'm a security researcher at Positive Technologies. Mm, the plan of the talk. First of all, I will tell you about the vulnerability, which I found, uh, show the exploit demo video, uh, and then describe the steps, uh, the exploit step by step. Uh, how to hit the race condition and get double free out of it, how to turn double free into user after free and exploit it, and finally, how to bypass SMEP, Supervisor Mode Execution Prevention, without return-oriented programming. I'll show another way to do it. And finally, about the defense. Uh, this vulnerability is a local privilege escalation flaw in the Linux kernel, and it has a race condition in the NHDLC kernel driver. Um, this driver is, uh, is provided by all major distros. It, is, it goes as a loadable kernel module, and that's why all major distros were affected. What, is, uh, what this driver is used for? It is a uh, driver supporting the line discipline for the TTY subsystem which supports high-level data link control protocol. It is a data link control, uh, data link protocol, uh, and its frames can be sent via serial lines, and now it's mainly used for device-to-device uh, uh, -device communication. And uh, this bug, this particular bug, was introduced quite a long time ago, in 2009, and uh, more than seven years later, uh, the syscaller father on my machine uh, gave me a suspicious crash. Uh, syscaller is a really good project. You should check out it. Uh, check out it. Um, it allowed to uh, make Linux kernel code uh, much better. Uh, and several uh, days after that, I had a stable REST condition uh, repro. And then uh, was a very intensive working time. And at the end of the month, I had an exploit proof of concept and the patch fixing this particular bug. Then uh, at the end of February, I contacted um, security at kernel.org. And uh, several uh, days after that, all major distros which were affected were informed about this uh, vulnerability. And uh, they were giving my, uh, th my patch was provided to them. Um, the 7th of March was the end of embargo, and I announced um, this vulnerability on the public mailing list. And at, th at that particular day, uh, distros provided uh, the update, a kernel update for, for Linux. And uh, several weeks after that, I published a write-up about this, uh, that vulnerability. And currently, um, there is a patch from me to a Linux kernel mainline, which allows to block similar attacks. And uh, it is now um, discussed in the Linux kernel mailing list. Uh, uh, what was wrong in the code? First of all, uh, the original driver used some self-made single link list uh, to store the buffer uh, uh, to store the buffers for sending uh, where uh, 
the line. And it used a special variable, tbuf, to store uh, the pointer to a buffer, uh, which we need to resend in case of transmit error. It was quite fine, but uh, later in that commit, uh, the buffer flushing feature was added. And it introduced uh, racy access to tbuf variable. Uh, now the sending function and flushing function can put this par particular uh, uh, buffer to the free list twice. And it would, uh, it went under insane, some uh, wrong locking. And mm, when you close the pseudo terminal later, the release functions, uh, release uh, function can free this buffer twice, which is a double free error. It is really dangerous, as it looks. And now I'll show the demo how to get root out of it. It was a fresh uh, Linux Mint installation. Now I'm showing that the machine, which I used to run uh, the exploit, didn't have SMAP feature, which, is, which stands for Supervisor Mode Access Prevention. I'll uh, give the details later. But uh, this machine has SMEP feature. You can see it. Uh, now I show that I run, I'm going to run this exploit as unprivileged user. Now showing the code, censored a little bit against uh, script kiddies. Then compile. And run. The exploit is really stable. It doesn't crush the kernel. And it uh, gets the root really fast. So that's it. Uh, now I will describe the exploit step by step, what I, I've done to do that. Um, and the main steps are, first of all, prepare the environment for, race, uh, for, for the race, to get the race condition. Then uh, hitting this race condition and getting double free. Then uh, heap spraying number one to turn this double free into use after free, which is exploitable. Uh, and uh, heap spraying number two to exploit this use after free. Uh, finally, heap stabilization for turning system into initial state. Uh, if we didn't hit the race condition, we should start the exploit once again. I, I mean, uh, go to the next iteration of the exploit. And finally, I will show uh, a, a new way how to bypass SMEP defense feature without return-oriented programming. Quite simple and nice. Now, first, prepare for the race. Uh, first of all, I'll show what is how uh, the pseudo-terminal uh, pseudo works and where uh, the vulnerable driver works in this diagram. So uh, pseudo-terminal is created when we open the pseudo-terminal master side and get the file descriptor for it, from it. Um, the terminal emulator works on this side, on the master side, and um, the program which is run in this pseudo terminal is, run, is running at the slave side. And the main logic is, going, uh, is happening here in the line discipline. Um, line discipline is a piece of kernel code which provides um, the logic like uh, clearing uh, the last uh, character if you hit backspace or echoing the input which you just put to the pseudo terminal 
back to Xterm, for example. Uh, and the vulnerable, vulnerable driver and HDLC driver is providing uh, the HDLC line discipline. And we will go to exploit this particular part. Uh, so to prepare for the race, first we stick to one single CPU uh, to make all the uh, driver vulnerable driver memory allocations going on on the single uh, allocator cache, which are per, uh, allocator caches are per CPU, and we want to uh, have all the work done in one cache. So then we open, as I said, we open the pseudo terminal master side, and the pseudo terminal uh, master and slave pair is uh, created. Then we set the line discipline for this pseudo terminal, and the vulnerable module is automatically loaded. We can now exploit it. Uh, then, uh, as I said, the race condition happening between sending and flushing in case of previous uh, sending error. And to make this, we, I suspend the pseudo terminal output and the buffer which I put in it, uh, uh, sending is failed, and it is, the pointer to it is saved to tbuf variable. Now we are ready for the race, and we allow uh, the threads of our exploit work on all CPU and compete to each other. Now the racing itself. First thread will flush the data. It will call this IO control. And the second thread uh, will start the suspended output. And it will try to send the buffer, which is stored at tbuf racy var variable. And it turned out that introducing legs in these threads make um, the whole, uh, make exploit work faster and hit the race condition earlier. Uh, so what do threads do? First, they synchronize at pthread barrier. You see it on the left uh, hand side. And then one of the thread, for example, flushing thread, is spinning in a busy loop. Um, but another thread already starts the communication with the vulnerable driver. And then at this special moment, they both use the tbuf variable and we have the race condition here. I might uh, have said that race condition is such situation in the system when the result of the uh, computing depends on the um, order of the operations. Uh, it is, so it is some non-deterministic situation in the system. And here, uh, the result of uh, working with tbuf variable depends uh, on how the threads collide. For choosing the leg length, uh, I used this code. So legs are introduced in turn for one uh, second thread, for, uh, for first thread, for second thread, uh, and it is growing. And it is maximized uh, by uh, 50 milliseconds. Microseconds, yes. And that makes the exploit go faster and threads collide earlier. We have faster exploit. Now, uh, triggering actual double free. We stick to the first uh, CPU core again and close the pseudo terminal. And the release function here works and uh, frees the buffers in the free list. If we had the race condition, we have double buffer and have double free. And kernel address sanitizer can detect it. And the report of the kernel address sanitizer was, in fact, the report from syscaller, which I got when I start. Uh, and after that, I started to investigate this issue. Now we need to exploit uh, the double free. Um, we try to do it. And if we got the root ID, we run the shell. Otherwise, go and race again. Um, now I want to show you how uh, double-free exploitation works in general. 
Um, the idea is quite beautiful, I would say. Uh, first, we allocate some object. And later, it is freed. It's fine. But uh, we have an error. We have uh, the second uh, freeing of this object A. Um, and we will use it. Now we allocate some another object, which, is, which has the same size. And the kernel allocator, for example, tends to give you the same address that, was, uh, that has been already freed, just freed. Because it, is, uh, uh, it can be accessed very fast. It was just uh, used. So uh, we allocate our object B at the same place here. But here, the second freeing, the bug, buggy freeing of the first object A happens. And it actually frees the object B. So now, after the object B is freed, we can do the heap spraying number two. We allocate another object of the same size. It is put at the place of object B, but it has our controllable payload. And then the code which actually uses the object B will work with the payload of object X and can do a malicious activity. That is the main idea of exploiting double free. So first heap spraying to turn double free into use after free. And using the object B is the exploitation of the, uh, this use after free error. Now about this particular exploit. Uh, the buffer which we are exploiting is allocated in uh, that uh, slab cache. Linux kernel allocator is called slab allocator. It prepares uh, some, several objects of the same size, say 8 kilobytes, and is ready to give them this object to the code which uh, uh, calls the kmalloc. So uh, we will exploit double free in this particular uh, cache. So we need two types of objects. First object for first heap spraying. Uh, which has a function pointer, and the second one with a controllable payload to override this function pointer and run our shell code. And it, uh, it turns out that uh, socket buffer in the Linux kernel uh, works very well as a first object. It has a function pointer which we can override. It can be allocated in the needed cache. And uh, I would say that it is the object for storing uh, network frames in the Linux kernel. So the actual network data is, uh, um, is stored here. And uh, struct skboof SK um, uh, stores the uh, meta information. So, but it turned out that uh, first heap spring, the overwriting uh, of the uh, double free, uh, doubly free object doesn't work so simple because the release function frees 13 uh, buffers straight away. There are 13 bu buffers in the list in, a, in, a, in the HDLC driver. And it um, frees it straight away. And all of them are put to the free list uh, of the allocator. And it turned out in it turns out that the doubly freed item is at the beginning of the free list. And it's not easy to get it back again. I was trying to put, uh, to create some network packet between the doubly freed at the beginning of this free list. But I didn't succeed because this um, NHDLC release function uh, goes on a single CPU and doesn't uh, in interrupt is not interrupted. So, still puzzled anyway. But if we look carefully, we see that this function, which freeze, uh, freezes the buffers, uh, doesn't crash the kernel. And that means that the alloca kernel allocator accepts consecutive freeing of the same address, of the same buffer. I it is strange. It is naive, but that's it. So if, we, if I spray after the release function, I can get 
uh, the buffers from the free list one by one, and finally uh, have such a cool situation. When I have two socket buffers pointing to the same data, and it is very nice because if we receive one of these buffers, we can have a use after free on the second one. Really nice. So for turning double free into use after free, I spawn, uh, spawn a lot of 8 kilobytes UDP packets after the race and uh, keep them allocated in the kernel memory. It's not easy because the socket queue for network packets is limited in size. And that's why I have a lot of socket queues, not to overflow them, and keep all my packets uh, in the kernel memory. And, and then I receive one of the twin socket buffers and have a use after free error on another one. That's nice. So uh, the heap spraying implementation looks like that. I have 200 server sockets for the heap spray and uh, send packets to them. And empirically, I know which packets are uh, likely to, be, uh, to point to the same data. I send it to a dedicated ser service socket to have a use after free error later on it. And then I, after receiving some packets from the dedicated service socket, I need to uh, return the state of the allocator to the initial position, um, uh, not to crush the kernel. That's why I send some packets to other 200 uh, service sockets f uh, to exhaust the partially freed slabs with slab objects in the kernel allocator and uh, start from scratch the next round of the racing and the next right round of the exploit. So uh, first heap spraying already done. Now we need to, uh, wow, now we need, after receiving one of twin packets, override the contents of the second one to uh, have a local privilege escalation. So now we are focused on the second heap spraying and uh, executing uh, the shell code. Heap spraying number two should override uh, destructor arg in the socket buffer. And another socket buffer doesn't work for that because uh, the, the structure with uh, the data which we want override is put at the same offset from the beginning all the time. So we don't control it. That's why uh, I needed another kernel object to override the destructor. And I was searching for it for a long time. I tried a lot of uh, kernel objects. And finally, I found that add key syscall can store the controllable payload in the kernel memory and can be allocated in the cache which I'm interested in. Nice. So let's see how the destructor is used. Uh, if, if the packet has this particular flag and the destructor is not null, uh, our callback is called. So uh, the second heap spraying should override the data and put this particular flag and override the destructor to our payload, which is uh, allocated in the user space. So uh, uboof and for structure with the callback is allocated in the user space, and the shell code is also in the user space memory. And here, when the destructor uh, will be, uh, instructor, destructor pointer will be dereferenced, uh, the SMAP can block our exploit. Uh, again, SMAP is a sub supervisor memory um, uh, access prevention, and it gives a fault if you fetch the, uh, if you dereference the pointer, uh, which points to user space memory in the kernel space. Uh, there are some techniques how to bypass it, and uh, uh, in my particular exploit, I will bypass the second uh, defense feature. It, it is called SMEP, which is Supervisor Memory Execution Prevention. 
the processor gives a fault if the if the CPU instruction is fetched from the user space address at the kernel space. And I will show how to bypass this, uh, that one. But it turns out that heap spraying number two to override the network packet uh, doesn't go so easy because we have so-called um, key data quotas. Uh, they are controlled by root, and the maximum size of, the, of our payload, which we have, can have in the kernel space, is only 2,000 bytes. That means that we can call only two at Kisses calls, which, uh, which will succeed, and it's not enough for spraying. So, <laughs> puzzled again, but uh, then I saw the bright idea in the slides of Dishen from Kin Security Lab. Thanks for, uh, to him for that, um, for that work. It turns out that successful heap spraying uh, doesn't depend on the success of the syscall which you call. So my, I allow my at key syscall fail, but the payload is actually was in the kernel memory, and it could override the socket buffer. That's fine. So just allow it to fail. So final uh, spring implementation looks like that. 20 packets to the server sockets for spring. Then uh, empirically, I understood that packets number 12, 13, 14, and 15 are likely to be doubled to point to the same data. And I send it to the dedicated server socket to receive later. Uh, and I receive these four packets one by one and call some at key syscalls in between to override the uh, second twin socket buffer. Finally, after receiving, so receiving is freeing, um, I restore the initial state of the allocator by sending uh, this 15 additional packets to another service. And it is the main thing which makes the exploit be so stable. Without that, uh, we have a kernel crash uh, when, it, uh, when the slab is fully f freed and it detects that it had uh, double free in it. So to avoid this kernel crash and make our exploit uh, work, we should restore and this technique called slab exhaustion. And th there are examples of working with at key syscall. This one is for storing our payload in the kernel space and uh, the invalidation for first two at key calls, which succeed. So finally, about bypassing SMEP. I'm showing that again. Uh, uh, when the kernel tries to execute the instruction at the user space, we have a fault. And there are several, uh, ah, first of all, I'll say that it is not software, but hardware feature. The x86 CPU provides it. And it is controlled at the 20th bit of CR4 register. So if we can write to this register and uh, set this bit, this particular bit to zero, we have uh, that feature disabled. And there are several ways how to bypass it, already known in public. You can uh, look at it later. They are quite uh, complex because um, the first one uh, uses return arrays in programming, and mm, both of them need uh, the arbitrary memory write to bypass SMEP and SMAP. And I will so show another easy way. It turns out that the kernel already had uh, the needed function. There is a native write CR4, which just uh, writes its argument to CR4 register. And let's look more carefully how the destructor is used. 
the callback is called with the address of uh, uh, ubuf info structure as the first argument, which is uh, also long, unsigned long. So, Erika, if we, uh, if I uh, use native write CR4 at the callback, and if I recite ubuf info at the memory which was got from mmap system call, and if our ubuf info recites at this particular address, the SMEP is disabled because this particular address is the right value of CR4 register without SM, uh, SMEP enabled on my machine. So just a map, put the payload on it, and have the SMEP disabled. Everything is, al is already ready in the kernel. And mm, after SMEP disabled, uh, I can race again to execute the uh, shell code on the second uh, successful exp exploit iteration. And I would like to add that uh, this correct value, the correct value of CR4 register is machine specific, and, but it can be uh, determined from the user space by CPU ID, CPU ID instruction on x86. Finally, about the fix. Uh, as I said, I approached the mainline maintainers with the patch for this race condition. And it uses just uh, standard kernel linked lists instead of those self-made. And I got rid of uh, the racy tbuf variable. Um, and if the sending fails, the buffer which was not sent is just put at the head of the queue for, uh, to, uh, to send it later, for sending it later. And um, as I showed you, the kernel locator behaves quite strange, allowing freeing the consecu consecutive freeing of the similar addresses. And for example, GNU C library has so-called fast stop check. When we, put, uh, when we free another object and put it to the free list, we check that, that, uh, that the address of that object is not equal to the previous uh, free, freed object. So uh, I did the same for the main line, and it's quite cheap. Uh, it is a cheap check which uh, can block the double free exploitation. And currently it is discussed in the Linux kernel mailing list. And I will, and I hope that it will get to the main line uh, behind this uh, particular config option. So they didn't allow me to put it by default in the, uh, to the kernel. Thanks. That's all. Uh, and <laughs> I would really appreciate your questions. I have nice souvenirs for best questions. Thank you very much, Alexander. And indeed, we have a lot of time for questions. So please go to the center of the stage where you will find microphones and post your questions, please. Hi. Um, you said that the, uh, the Linux kernel maintainers did not want to add the mitigation by default. Why? Um, thanks for the question. First of all, they already have all the corresponding checks um, in the slab debug feature. If you run your kernel with slab debug in the kernel parameters, the allocator checks whether it has double free or other uh, errors, uh, for example, um, allocator metadata corruption. So they didn't want to have the same feature in two places. So, uh, but the problem is that the default kernel which distro provides doesn't have this uh, option, and so it just the allocator just accepts freeing the same address twice. 
Did they the provide role. any solutions for the fact that nobody ships with this enabled? Um, they allowed me to have this check uh, under the the specific uh, kernel config option, and I hope that several distributions which are uh, which want to provide security for the users will use this option. Uh, this particular option has a nice feature. It randomizes the address of the items in the free list. So if uh, the attacker has the heap overflow exploit and it, uh, he wants to override the next pointer in the free list, it will uh, have to guess the cookie which is stored in, uh, um, which is unique for all CPU, all allocator caches. And I hope that my check will be also included in this config option. All right, thanks. Thank you. Next question, please. Hi, do I understand correctly that this only works if you have both the user space and kernel space in the same mapping? So if you have the kernel that does not map user space in the same address space as the kernel, would this still work? Some architectures don't map uh, the user space in the kernel uh, under space. Um, yeah. uh, Linux has it by design right now. Uh, so yeah, on, uh, Intel. Uh, uh, on Intel, uh, uh, on Intel, you map uh, kernel uh, and user space mm -hmm. in the same address space. But you map the kernel, you, you mark the kernel as kernel so that the user space cannot access it. But, uh, but currently some, some other architectures d don't do that. Yes, uh, on x86, uh, the segmentation is not used. It is historically like that. So uh, it is all mapped. Yeah, but not all architectures do that. Yes, for example, uh, JR Security patch set has a uh, so called UDRF feature uh, which uses the segmentation and helps against this attack. It's not about segmentation. I'm talking like other architectures, not, not, not Intel, like, uh, I don't know, Z, or where you don't have uh, the user space mapped in, in the same address space of the kernel. So if you, if you pass Do you know uh, if you pass whether it's like it that for ARM, is it, for Linux? Maybe. I don't know about ARM. But, okay. uh, so would your exploit still work if you don't have the user space in the same address space as the kernel? Um, Maybe some return-oriented programming will help against it. Uh, but the technique which I uh, showed, Vitaly Nikolenko um, provided it, it also maps, uh, it is called stack pivoting, when you uh, move your kernel stack onto user space memory. And then uh, the kernel stack is controlled, and you can do whatever you want with return-oriented programming. But it also uses. Uh, this fact that the user space memory is mapped at the kernel space. Uh, the kernel, uh, when you run this is system call, uh, the kernel works in the kernel space on behalf on, of the process which called this syscall. So my exploit is the user space program. It calls some system calls. And the kernel works on behalf of the exploit in the kernel space. So the kernel, when it uh, executes the system call, knows which process asked for that. And uh, uh, that uh, need to work. Uh, and if we don't map user space, address, uh, user space memory to the kernel space, we should provide this feature. The kernel should know which process is executed right now. Thank you. More questions from the audience. You have an specialist. Please come to the mic. Hi. Hi. Could you tell some more about the process of informing the Linux kernel or the other Linux kernel developers and the distros, etc.? Because <laughs> you, in the beginning of your talk, you gave the timeline. Yes. And it, could, it uh, took a couple of days. So can you tell? How it worked? Did it work smoothly? Were there any issues, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Yes. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, first, I contacted security at kernel.org, 
And it took us some time to understand that uh, the vulnerability uh, is serious because it affects uh, the, all major distros are affected. At first, uh, maintainers didn't mm, didn't get that it is this option is enabled on all distros. And three days late, uh, left, uh, later, uh, one of the kernel security uh, engineers contacted the distros uh, and described the vulnerability. My patch, which I sent to security at kernel.org, was sent to the distros. Uh, but there was some additional work needed because all stable kernel release was also affected because the vulnerability was introduced in 2009, as you, say, uh, as you see. Uh, so quite a long time ago. So not only all major distros was affected, all stable kernel releases was affected as well. And uh, some of them uh, didn't have the uh, today's uh, standard kernel uh, linked lists. So uh, I worked with distro developers and uh, to provide a patch which will work, which will fix the issue on the old stable kernel releases. Um, and the embargo, which I uh, noticed, is the special date uh, when I'm allowed to share the information about this vulnerability. And at this particular date, uh, the distros give the kernel update for their users. So it, is, uh, it happens uh, almost simu simultaneously uh, to decrease the ch chances of black hats to attack this vulnerability in case they can um, reproduce the bug and write the exploit very fast. So uh, that's why uh, security researchers usually don't give the exploit straight away, but waits for some time. E exploit proof of concept, I mean. Uh, but they wait for some time to allow all distro users update their systems. Of course, unfortunately, not all people do that. Not on all people update uh, their systems, and they stay vulnerable. Uh, and when I wrote to security at kernel.org, the security engineers uh, maintainers uh, got CVE ID themselves. Now it, it has changed. Um, uh, there is a special organization called Mitra, which gives the CVE numbers to the vulnerabilities. And now you should uh, contact Mitra yourself, uh, describe the vulnerability, um, show the impact and you will get the CVE identifier for this vulnerability. So uh, now it is your responsibility to get this number. And this number is important because it helps to track whether your system has all um, current security updates. It helps to understand whether you have all recent patches for the vulnerabilities. Um, that's it. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Someone else? More questions from the public? No? Uh, I would like to continue on that question. Who sets the time for embargo? Uh, kernel maintainers. They, uh, in collaboration with the distros, decide how much time do they need to fix the issue and to prepare the new kernels for the, for the users. What if they guess wrong this time of embargo? They can also update uh... Uh, straight away. Yeah. So change. Let's say we need one more month or one more week. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look good to stay vulnerable if the information about the vulnerability is already uh, available. So, um, as you saw, less than a week and all distros provided the patch.
Next question, please. Uh, the man behind the, at the back first, sorry. What miss you, uh, hello? What measures does the kernel take in order to prevent falling on the same stone twice? Um, could you repeat, please? Yes. What measures is the kernel taking in order to prevent stepping on the same stone twice? Um, if I understood you right, uh, you are asking what did I, did I do to prevent double freeing, right? No. I'm asking how does the kernel... Get, get closer to the mic, please. I'm asking, how does, how does the kernel prevent this from happening again? Uh, ah, you mean this particular bug, the race condition? Or this particular cl class of bugs or problems? Um, there is no general defense against the race condition. <laughs> the proper defense is proper code with proper locking. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> yes, and um, the result of the race condition can be different. In this particular case, it was double free, and it can be detected. Uh, for example, slab debug uh, option for the kernel uh, makes the kernel drop the second freeing of the same item. So it, uh, on every freeing, it goes through the free list in the allocator and drops uh, the current freeing if we already freed this item. And mm, I can't say that I like it very much, because um, if double free happened, it, that means that the bug already uh, was hit somewhere in the kernel. It's already bad. So maybe it is not good to trust the process which caused this double free error. But anyway, slab debug provides that. Uh, uh, there are, mm, maybe there are other defenses um, against the results of the race conditions. But I, uh, ah, uh, yes, uh, there is the nice project called Thread Sanitizer. You may have heard about that. It is a, a brother of kernel address sanitizer and so on. And uh, it provides some uh, compile time instrumentation to detect the race conditions, the race access to some memory. Uh, it stores the meta information about uh, the memory in a separate place and just check it all the time when you have the access. It doesn't uh, work very fast, but anyway, it can uh, be used for debugging the kernel. And that uh, it is uh, not currently in the main line because it has a lot of false positive errors. But anyway, you can... Uh, apply the patch and try to uh, run your kernel with this debug option and see all the reports and fix the code. So it is a debugging feature, thread sanitizer. Thank you for your question. I have the question, uh, is it exploitable on the AMD64? And uh, the second question is uh, when it will be, uh, like script kiddies, script kiddies version will be available. <laughs> Okay, yes, it uh, can be exploited on AMD, sure. And um, I already wrote a detailed write-up about this vulnerability and the exploit. It has some uh, parts of the code. Uh, and this talk provided some details. I didn't really want to give the full exploit just... F because um, there are... Anyway, a lot of uh, um, uh, out, out of date kernels on the systems of different people. Uh, sometimes people say just, we have defended the perimeter of our own network. It's fine to have uh, out of date systems inside. <laughs> so um, that's why I don't give the full exploit. Thank you. Next question, please. Since this bug is uh, in such a hot path, uh, do you think it is possible to live patch it? Uh, live patch it? Yes. Um, thanks for your question. Um, I, uh, while working on the um, fix with the distros, I was contacted with um, a developer from Oracle. They have some live patching uh, subsystem. 
and uh, we were working on some really small fix um, uh, which can be applied with that. Um, this live patches are working as the kernel modules. You just load this patch module into your kernel and uh, the code paths, uh, paths uh, are fixed. But uh, it should not be really big. That's why we work to make it as smaller as we can to live update the systems. You're talking about case splice. I'm talking about k-patch. Yes. The vanilla kernel uh, live patching mechanism. Yes. Uh, both of them can do it. Thank you for your question. Yes. Question in the front, please. I have another question for you. Uh, you said somewhere near the start of the presentation that uh, the cause of this was a homegrown linked list implementation. Uh, I can imagine that a lot of these kind of homegrown implementations are going to be wrong in some way. Uh, how common are these in the Linux kernel, uh, homegrown implementations of something that should really be using a standardized kernel implementation? Um, I would say that this particular driver is quite old and it was not uh, used very intensively. So it is not some uh, uh, kernel code which has a lot of developers looking into it. And uh, there are a lot of such code in Linux kernel. It has more than 20 million strings of code, as I remember. So it's quite big. But um, this particular bug was, I, I was lucky to find it because it was enabled on all distros. So I guess it can be possible to write a simple program which finds you all, uh, the oldest code uh, which your distro provides you. <laughs> and uh, for example, Fuzzit. All right, thanks. Thank you. Question in the back, please. Yes, I'd, I'd like to hear more about how this bug was detected in the first place. One of your early slides said that somebody contacted you. Um, do you have more information how this was originally detected and uh, why it came to you? Uh, uh, originally, it was detected on my system. So I ran syscaller further on uh, uh, my machines and got the suspicious crash. Uh, that suspicious, uh, then I investigated why this crash happened. And uh, the cool f feature about syscaller, it can provide C program which reproduces this crash. It, uh, it just calls a lot of syscalls on a virtual machine, and then you can run the result again. So you can reproduce the bug again and see uh, this particular crash. And then, after ha I had a stable repro, I started to investigate how to exploit it. Not to have a crash, but have a root. And uh, um, so it all happened on my machine, and you can uh, install and use syscaller too. It's quite easy, and they have nice uh, wiki on GitHub. So uh, I really like people who develop it. Thank you. More questions from the audience. You can still enjoy about seven minutes of open question time. <laughs> Nobody else? <laughs> well, in that case, I will close the session. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you very much. A big round of applause for him.